So I'm here to introduce Risa Goiboff. She is the 12th Dean of the University of Virginia Law School, uh, one of the world's leading public law schools. Uh, <laughs> she joined the UVA faculty in 2002, and in addition, in addition to her appointment as the Arnold H. Leon Professor of Law, she holds appointments as Professor of History, uh, faculty affiliate as, at the uh, Carter Woodson Institute for African American and African Studies, and faculty senior fellow at the Miller Center. She is the recipient of UVA Law's Carl McFarland Award for Excellence in Faculty Scholarship, as well as the University of Virginia's All University Teaching Award, the Guggenheim, the Fulbright, and Fellowship from ACLS. She holds an undergrad degree from Harvard, a JD from Yale, and a PhD in history from Princeton University. Prior to joining the law school, she, she clerked for Judge Guido Calabresi and Justice Stephen Breyer of the Supreme Court, and she also served as a Fulbright Scholar to South Africa. For her undergraduate thesis, <laughs> she spent a semester living on Johns Island, South Carolina, collecting oral histories and volunteering with a community-based organization. And in 2016, she told the UVA paper, UVA Today, is that really UVA Today? Yeah, yeah nice. <laughs> Studying the Southern Civil Rights Movement exposed her to the power of lawyers, as well as the power of grassroots organizations. And she said, law isn't something out there that exists in the world in a vacuum outside of human control. The law is what people make it. So human enterprise is an, idea, is an idea that she has continually come back to in her scholarship, not only lawyers shaping law, but everyday people shaping law, an undergirding theme in her award-winning books, including The Lost Promise of Civil Rights, Vagrant Nation, Police Power, Constitutional Change, and The Making of the 1960s. These two books are major research monographs that have changed the face of 20th century US legal history. In my notes now, I now have the awards that the books have won. It's pretty much all of them. So I will just stop there. Uh, Lisa sums up the dialectic of the American legal past and American legal present as follows. By un uncovering historical alternatives to the civil rights law we know as our own, we can broaden our imagination about the possibilities for addressing the remnants of Jim Crow still facing your nation today. Uh, I personally am uh, thrilled to have her here. She is an ally uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in higher ed uh, and, and other causes, um, and, and which is why I'm sad to say that I have to go run off to a reception and then a dinner. But you know what? If I were speaking at UVA, she'd probably do the same to me. So please join me in welcoming as I exit Risa Goyeva. Thank you, Mark, for that lovely introduction. And I do completely understand the need to leave. So um, see if I can push that in. No? Okay. Uh, can you hear me, or do I need to use the microphone? Does it matter? Yes, the microphone? You can hear me. OK. I've never been uh, particularly quiet. I'm so happy to be here among uh, so many friends. And I'm honored at the invitation and excited to uh, talk to all of you today. What I plan to talk about is related to some of the things uh, that uh, Dean West said, but in a slightly different register. So I want to talk to you today uh, on behalf of as a, and as an advocate for constitutional history and a new kind of constitutional history. And I'll do so with reference to my more recent book that Dean West mentioned, Vagrant Nation, Police Power, Constitutional Change, and the Making of the 1960s. Uh, I want to start with my methodological approach, which sets the stage for um, all of what I have to say. So when we think about constitutional history, most of the time we think about the Supreme Court. And most constitutional history written in the United States has been Supreme Court-centered and fairly linear. Uh, and the new constitutional history is far less linear. It doesn't start or end with the Supreme Court, though it does still include it. But it also includes all kinds of other actors in the legal system, other judges, lawyers, litigants and other lay people, social movement organizations, academics, politicians, government officials, journalists. Uh, the old constitutional history not only stays at one kind of horizontal level at the court, but it also tends, when it goes down, to go down in vertical swatches. Uh, it tends to stick to one litigation campaign or one type of litigation. So think Brown versus Board of Education and the campaign against school, de school segregation, or think the same-sex marriage campaign. The new constitutional history 
not only includes multiple actors at different levels of the law creation process, but also different social contexts, different social movements, engaging different sub subdisciplines of history. So crossing boundaries along many dimensions. When you embrace this new methodological approach to constitutional history, when you change how we tell history, you then see tremendous impacts on how we see our past, historiographical impacts, what we know about constitutional change, historical impacts, and how we think about our future normative impacts. So I'm going to start with my story and then broaden out from there. Um, given my methodological priors, it's not that easy to start with my story, uh, given that I think there should be multiple actors and uh, less linear narratives, it's always a challenge to figure out how to start. So I'm tempted to start this way. For the first time in 1952, the Supreme Court took a case to determine whether a vagrancy law was constitutional. The case came out of 1949 Los Angeles, where a man named Isidore Edelman, who was a soapbox orator in Pershing Square, he had to commute to Pershing Square uh, to be a soapbox orator. He had uh, communist views, though he'd been kicked out of the Communist Party, uh, and he was repeatedly arrested for his soapbox orating. He was arrested 63 times in fairly quick succession, and then arrested for vagrancy. So vagrancy laws, which you may or may not know, and related loitering and suspicious persons laws, came to uh, the colonies, first the colonies, from medieval and Elizabethan England. Uh, they came here with the colonists, and then eventually most states and localities had vagrancy laws for centuries. There were two hallmarks of vagrancy laws that made them particularly useful to law enforcement authorities and local officials. The first is that vagrancy laws were status offenses. There is a Jacksonville ordinance that will come up again in 1972 that said the following. This is not all of it, but it's a bunch of it. Rogues and vagabonds, 1972, or dissolute persons who go about begging, persons who use juggling or unlawful games or plays, common drunkards, common night walkers, thieves, pilferers or pickpockets, traders and stolen property, common railers and brawlers, persons wandering or strolling about from place to place without any lawful purpose or object, habitual loafers, disorderly persons, shall be deemed vagrants. Not commit the crime of vagrancy, but shall be deemed vagrants, are a particular type of person. So laws like this sanction the arrest of whoever police deem to be vagrants and fit into one of these categories on site, without them doing anything in particular. The second hallmark of vagrancy laws was their vague and broad language, as you can tell from this, habitual loafer wandering about with no apparent object. Uh, and it made it possible for the police to, f to, to arrest pretty much anyone they wanted to uh, under the guise of a vagrancy law because these laws were both opaque and quite flexible. And for centuries, that's exactly what happened. Local officials employed vagrancy laws against anyone who was out of place in any way, and not just those you think of as quote unquote vagrants. They used vagrancy laws to regulate and extract labor from the resident poor, to exclude and punish poor strangers, to incapacitate apparent threats to the social order, to prevent the commission of incipient crime, to enforce racial segregation and subordination, and to discipline minorities, dissidents, and nonconformists of all stripes. Isidore Edelman, our communist, fit into this last category, a communist at the height of the Cold War. The section of the California vagrancy law that he was convicted under made a vagrant of anyone who was dissolute. He was dissolute because he was lawless, because he had been arrested 63 times before. So that made him a vagrant. The Supreme Court agreed to hear his case. It was the first time they considered a vagrancy law, but they then dismissed it as improvidently granted. For those in the biz, that's a dig, dismiss as improvidently granted. Over the next 20 years, the Supreme Court repeatedly took vagrancy cases, digged them, or found other ways to avoid them. And in fact, it was not in the Warren Court, the traditionally more liberal Warren Court, uh, that these laws finally went down but it was in the more conservative Burger Court in 1972. Though the justice who wrote the opinion, uh, William O. Douglas, was a holdover, not just from the Warren Court, but way, way back, uh, and one of the most liberal justices ever to sit on the court. The case in which 
uh, the law was struck down was that Jacksonville law that I read to you a minute ago, uh, and the case was called Papa Christou v. City of Jacksonville. It involved eight defendants of a variety of types, but the most prominent of whom were two white women and two African-American men who were out on the town in 1969 Jacksonville, Florida, who were convicted for vagrancy by prowling by auto. Now, that was not in the statute that I just read to you, and I didn't omit it. Uh, my book and this talk is about what happened between Edelman and Papa Christou. Between the 1950s and the 1970s, vagrancy laws moved from a state of legitimacy to one of illegitimacy. It's not that everybody thought that they were legitimate before the 1950s, especially those who were regulated by them, but most legal professionals thought them different from most other laws, which required acts and not just status for conviction, uh, but valid nonetheless. And of course, not everyone thought them illegitimate by the 1970s, especially those who deemed them necessary for public safety and order. But when the Supreme Court struck them down, it crystallized a sea change in constitutional status. The question of my book is how did that change happen? How does something legitimate for 400 years become illegitimate over the course of 20? And the secondary question is what happened in the aftermath? So that's introduction number one. As an introduction, I think that would be fine as far as it goes. It provides a narrative framing of the book, but it only goes so far toward representing the story that I'm telling. It's too linear. It's too focused on the Supreme Court. It's too triumphalist. Good, the end of vagrancy laws triumphs over evil, discriminatory policing. It's too reminiscent of the old constitutional history and too divorced from people who lived under the threat and reality of vagrancy arrests. In other words, the humanity is largely missing. So let me try again. Introduction number two. This one starts with some folks you have never heard of, save one or two, Isidore Edelman and Margaret Papa Christou. But you meet here also shuffling Sam Thompson, who was a handyman and a junk peddler, an African-American and an alcoholic. He was a constant target of police harassment, usually at the Louisville bus station. He lived out of town. He had to take the bus home. He stopped going to the Louisville bus station to avoid harassment, and instead he went to, I'm not making this up, he went to get a drink at the Liberty End Cafe, where the police found him and arrested him uh, for the 55th time as he ate some macaroni and shuffled his feet to the jukebox, hence the shuffling. Meet also the Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, a, quote, notorious person in the field of civil rights in Birmingham. He was a co-founder with Martin Luther King Jr. of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and he was arrested for loitering for refusing to vacate a street corner uh, where he was talking with a few of his colleagues during a boycott of downtown department stores in uh, Birmingham in the spring of 1962. Meet Joy Kelly, a young hippie in Charlotte, North Carolina, known as the San Francisco of North Carolina, okay. Uh, rented a house uh, at, to use as a crash pad for her hippie friends and herself, and suffered police harassment at all hours of the day and night. 18 people were arrested for vagrancy while in the house, including Joy herself, who had a lease for this house, and she was told that if she ever returned to the house again, she would be arrested for vagrancy again. Meet Stephen Wainwright a Tulane law student who was unlucky enough to resemble a murder suspect uh, when he went out to get a midnight bite to eat in the French Quarter in New Orleans. Uh, the police wanted to see if he had a tattoo that said, born to raise hell on his arm. And being a good law student who knew his rights, he refused and was thereafter arrested for vagrancy. Uh, and finally, Martin Hershorn, who had dressed as a woman since he was 17. He was a hairstylist in Manhattan. The police entered his home and found him wearing only a half slip and a brassiere and arrested him under an old New York law that made anyone masquerading in public a vagrant. Query whether he was masquerading. Clearly, he was not in public. These folks are obscure unconnected and very different from one another. They're white and black, men and women, arrested in public and private for their political protests or for seeming like a murderer, for their sexuality or their poverty or their long hair. They made very different constitutional claims under free speech and association, various criminal procedure clauses, cruel and unusual punishment, involuntary servitude, discrimination on the basis of race or poverty, privacy, and other fundamental rights. Their differences show the kaleidoscope that was vagrancy regulation, its ubiquity, its flexibility, its use as an ever-present police tool to keep people in their imagined places. These folks are a big part of the answer to the question of my book. 
How did vagrancy laws lose their, their legitimacy? Social movements and other, charge, other changes of the 19th centuries are a big answer to that. Vagrancy challenges came from African Americans and other civil rights activists, from communists, labor union members, poor people, beats, hippies, gay men, lesbians, and other sexual minorities, women, Vietnam War protesters, student activists, young urban minority men, and other dissidents. Folks who had been regulated were now organized, assertive, and here is crucial, and had lawyers. And they found that vagrancy laws were obstacles to their other goals, whether those goals were sexual freedom, racial equality, political protest, or something else. It is not a coincidence that representatives of most of the major progressive social movements of the time were involved in the vagrancy challenge. If you can't walk down the street without being arrested on site, then it's hard to vindicate your other rights. Another way of putting this point is that police officers, as much as legislatures, hindered the social movements of the 60s and were equally in need of interventions. So that's introduction number two. It's better methodologically. It gets at the history of vagrancy law by identifying law in the everyday life of everyday people. Change comes, as historians like to say, from below, from regular people recognizing enforcement of these laws as potentially constitutionally problematic and seeking redress. It also begins to reveal why change looked the way it did. The lived experience of the law is critical to the development of legal doctrine, who challenges the law, in what contexts, and with what resources. Those have tremendous impact not only on whether the law changes, but also on the timing, the process, and the substance of the changes if and when they happen. Introduction number two is better, but it's not quite right. It's too disconnected. The stories are too disparate. How do these separate stories of lived legal and constitutional experience become a single story of constitutional history? Where are the sinews, the networks, the connections, other than my own abstract conceptualization that bring them together? My third and final attempt. Introduction number three. Many of us know the story of Brown versus Board of Education, how a band of lawyers in the NAACP methodically challenged segregation and won. And that's the model of legal change that we have in the back of our heads. In my first book, I actually show how this was oversimplified in many ways, uh, though the core of the NAACP's campaign remained intact. Not so in this book. This book is also about a legal change, about a challenge to the constitutionality of vagrancy laws. But this challenge was not coordinated in New York or Washington. It was incremental, loosely networked, a correlated set of actor, uh, actions by a whole host of different actors. Vagrancy cases popped up everywhere. And rather than one person or organization proselytizing or organizing or colonizing to make their vision happen, it resulted from an aggregate energy of lawyers across the country facing down similar but different laws in similar but different circumstances again and again and again. Because this is a book about the 60s, I often think about the Brown model as kind of like a 1950s high school prom. It's organized, it's fixed, it's known, even if it's contingent in some of what happens inside the boundaries. But the vagrancy challenge is more like a 1960s happening. No one really planned it, the guest list is unwritten, there are no invitations, the entertainment is self-created, and the location, duration, and content uh, are relatively spontaneous and open. And at first, I was really troubled by this lack of central coordination, because I had a model in my head of how legal change happens. But I now realize that this different kind of legal change is equally important. A vagrancy challenge that provokes hundreds of reports reported cases in a single decade without central coordination reveals a legal regime that is so pervasive, so centrally important to the maintenance of a certain kind of order and hierarchy in American society that every social movement of the era ran smack into it and tried to push it over. So this introduction pushes us to examine how lawyers came to show judges the vagrancy problems of disparate people in disparate circumstances in disparate places as connected. So for this, for this introduction, I want you to meet some other folks, the lawyers. Meet A.L. Weirin and Fred Okrand, who represented our communist Isidore Edelman, our soapbox orator. They were affiliated with the Southern California ACLU. As early as the 1930s, Al Weirin used uh, uh, challenged vagrancy laws when California growers used them against farm workers who were trying to organize into unions. And as late as 1983, his law partner, uh, Fred Okrand, 
was representing uh, someone in the United States Supreme Court in a decision striking down a new California loitering law used against an African-American man who frequently walked around a white neighborhood. So between them, Weirin and Okren spanned a half century of vagrancy challenges involving questions as wide-ranging as labor, free speech, and race. Meet Ernest Bessig, who was the head of the Northern California ACLU. Where Weirin and Okren faced different vagrancy defendants at different times, Bessig simultaneously responded to complaints in 1950s San Francisco from the Beats, from gay men and lesbians, and from African Americans. And he saw that the police were using the same law against all three, and he understood this as a singular problem. And meet Anthony Amsterdam, who published a paper on why vague laws were unconstitutional while still in law school. This is a challenge to all of you and to all of us. Uh, that would structure much of the lawyerly and judicial thinking about vagrancy laws for decades. He suggested that the laws were too vague because they did not give enough guidance to people to avoid criminal behavior or to law enforcement to avoid arbitrary or discriminatory enforcement. Anthony Amsterdam moved between the academy and practice. He was most deeply involved with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, but he also collaborated with the ACLU. He brought, vagrancy, he brought his vagrancy expertise to bear in the civil rights struggle, in Vietnam War protests, and in the criminal procedure cases that the justices found the most difficult to deal with. These and other lawyers began with discrete problems brought to them by discrete people, but they began to see connections between them. They began to construct vagrancy law as a legal problem. Weirin and Okren did not initially think of the problem that way. They thought about police infringements of free speech against workers. And initially, Bessig saw the police as the problem in their own right, not just these laws. But as more and more challenges uh, uh, accumulated over time, they began to see a vagrancy law problem, and they began to see constitutional challenge as the main attack. They argued about the connections across cases. They built on arguments about the protean nature of vagrancy laws and about the commonalities of the various groups regulated by them. In thinking about the lawyers, we get to another part of the answer to the how question. How did this constitutional change happen? It changed because of legal develop developments that were changing in this period that were related to, caused by, and facilitative of the various social movements we've been talking about. There were new visions of the First Amendment and free speech at this time, of policing, criminal justice, and the protection of defendants' due process rights, of the role of the substantive criminal law in maintaining crime control as opposed to social control of labor and poverty, their causes and people's right to choose how to participate in the labor market, of pluralism, nonconformity and privacy, and of anti-discrimination and equality. The book shows how all of these various strands of legal, social, and intellectual history come together in the vagrancy law attack. So that's introduction number three. Don't worry, I'm done with introductions. And again, it works uh, as far as it goes. It shows how lawyers serve as mediators and gatekeepers. They are the centers of networks and movers of information, politics, and norms, as well as law, across actors, regions, and legal processes. But lawyers are still not the whole story. Each of these beginnings is a false start. For the real story must put them all together. And that is what my book does in the name of this new constitutional history. It puts the story together and does two things that historians had not done before. First, it constructs a history of American vagrancy laws and their constitutional downfall. And second, it uses that history as a lens into the legal history of the 1960s writ large. Vagrancy laws were persistent, flexible, and ubiquitous tools of oppression, and their demise both propelled and reflected the larger changes of the 1960s. To tell these stories in the mode of the new constitutional history requires that I move not only across social movements and types of vagrancy victims, but also up and down the legal process, from defendant to lawyer to justice and back again, as well as through all the other actors involved in that process, police officers, prosecutors, local officials, journalists. I show how the Supreme Court gradually comes to the view that the lawyers on the ground increasingly understood that the vagrancy laws were a key part of the establishment that had to fall for even parts of the 60s social movements to succeed. It was not, in 1952, obvious that vagrancy cases of a communist soapbox orator, a skid row alcoholic, a hippie, a civil rights leader, a genuine transvestite had much in common. 
That becomes increasingly apparent over time. And that is what the lawyers come to argue over the course of 20 years and around a dozen cases at the Supreme Court. They kept accumulating and layering on these arguments in a process of analogy and connection. And by the time of Papa Christou v. City of Jacksonville in 1972, the court had come across many different types of vagrancy victims, and Papa Christou itself collected a number. That success came in Papa Christou in 1972 and not in Edelman in 1952 changed not only the timing of the, of the changing constitutional status of vagrancy laws, but also its contours. When William O. Douglas wrote the opinion in Papa Christou, he had already been leading the charge against vagrancy laws for some time. In his po po probably apocryphal own accounts of his life, he describes how he rode the rails with hobos and the industrial workers of the world as a youth, uh, how he sang Woody Guthrie songs and Hallelujah, I'm a Bum. He, in fact, was an honorary member of the uh, Hobos of America. Uh, uh, he, he was. He was a knight of the open road. Uh, and, uh, uh, and he had a vagrancy folder. He was the only justice. He had a folder where he collected all of the vagrancy cases and various other things about vagrancy. He was convinced of this in 1952. But the fact that this didn't happen until 1972 enabled him to write a very different kind of opinion than he would have written 20 years earlier. And the opinion that he wrote was something of an anthem for the long 1960s. Uh, and, and it makes possible seeing the close link between the visibility, the increasing visibility of these constitutional problems of vagrancy laws and the larger social and cultural challenges of the 60s. And in fact, this was Douglas's, Douglas on the court for uh, uh, almost 40 years, um, and this was the opinion he asked to be read at his funeral. Uh, he was really, really proud of, of what this opinion did and how it read. Okay. So I seem to have told much of the story in the course of just offering up these three introductions. Uh, and having gotten past the introduction by failing to choose from, I am ready to conclude. But there are several parts to the conclusion as well. So I'll start with the overarching methodological question with which I began. How should we write about constitutional change? This is the methodological question. And then the implications for what that history tells us about our past, the historiographical ones, what it tells us about constitutional change, the historical ones, and then finally how to think about our future, the normative ones. The methodological questions were at the heart of this book, and they are at the heart of my own scholarly preoccupations. Um, I always start with the question of how not why, and obviously why is a big part of the how, but I want to understand how constitutional and legal change happens. And when you ask that question, you are forced to ask not only about the Supreme Court, because they only decide the cases that come to them, and they are stuck with the facts that they're given and the people who bring them their cases, so you have to approach constitutional history through the experiences and perspectives of multiple actors and multiple institutions in order to see new stories stories and new types of stories altogether. You have to not limit yourself to a single social organization or a single legal actor or a single organization. You have to look for connections across groups, institutions, types of laws or claims, as well as across time and space. So I would say find a boundary and cross it. This book could not have been written without doing that. No doubt, parts of the story had long been told before I came to them. But this had never been viewed as a story. It had always been viewed as multiple and fragmented stories. And in part, that fragmentation resulted from fragmentation among scholars. A colleague of mine commented that uh, everyone always tries to own my story, that they think, oh, no, your story, it's part of my framework, right? Um, and it was a big challenge for me to figure out what my framework was going to be. Because when I came to this project, scholars had already divvied up the cases in a variety of ways. They'd only seen parts of it by litigant, civil rights protester, skid row alcoholic, soapbox orator, by constitutional claim, free speech, equal protection, criminal procedure, privacy, or by historical subdiscipline, race, labor, poverty, sexuality, politics, geography. But not a single one of these perspectives, no single scholarly vocabulary can account for this story or in fact even see it. A history of vagrancy law only becomes visible and possible once one recognizes as the litigants, legislators, lawyers, and judges of the 1960s increasingly, but still often partially did, 
that despite different emphases and vocabularies, vagrancy cases involved a common claim to make one's own place in the world. They shared a common insistence, either on their right to make their own place, the faultiness of the whole idea of place, or both. And I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. I have no doubt that the vagrancy law story is not unique, that our legal and constitutional history hides as much as it reveals in its current state, and that asking which boundaries to cross and how to make visible what has been invisible will yield up immense new areas of inquiry and understanding. This methodological approach to constitutional history has implications for historiographical, historical, and normative questions in turn. Historiographically, it opens up not only the history of vagrancy law, but also the history of the 1960s writ large. Social and cultural historians like to think of the 1960s as a movement of movements, overlapping, an overlapping moment of social change. But it's rare that those movements connect with one another, and there's not much law in them. Legal histories of the period tend to be narrow. Biographies, case histories, stories of specific litigation campaigns. There is the 60s of the civil rights movement, which rarely meets the 60s of the counterculture. And perhaps that's understandable. It's too wieldy. It's too unwieldy, and it's too sprawling. But the lens of vagrancy law enables one to integrate the histories, these histories of the 1960s, while still attending to differences among marginal groups and their interactions with police power. This history shows how law functioned to expand cultural pluralism and tolerance within limits, and shows a growth of a national legal culture intruding on local norms. Three aspects of the 60s uh, come to the fore, especially in this story, as I think historiographical interventions. The first is this idea of people out of place that I've already mentioned. Being out of place played a role in both how those deemed, uh, deemed out of place understood their predicament and how those who wanted to keep them in place understood the target's transgressions. And I, I spent a lot of time at the beginning of this book um, trying to figure out what vocabulary to use that would cross all these boundaries. And I eventually came upon this idea, which was language used at the time. You find it in police manuals. Uh, you find it in the challenges to vagrancy laws, um, that the problem was people who are were out of place in some way. They weren't all out of place in the same way. Some were out of place by choice, think hippies. Some by force or coercion, think African Americans. Some were physically out of place, some metaphysically out of place. But the notion that the hierarchies in American society had become anachronistic and that vagrancy laws represented that anachronism in an especially pure form was organic to the time. The idea of place had to be contested for the transformations of the 1960s to succeed. The second new historiographical theme of the 60s that I think becomes visible in the vagrancy story was the challenging and changing relationship between difference and danger. As the notion of being out of place itself suggests, and police manuals at the time evidence, being out of place was in and of itself dangerous. Distinguishing between difference and danger was at the heart of what it meant to allow people to be out of place. It was not that danger disappeared or that such differentiation ended altogether or that one can easily differentiate between moral danger and physical danger or justify protecting against one but not the other. But with the vagrancy law challenge and the other revolutions of the 1960s, the era that the vagrancy story reveals is one in which difference and danger get at least partially disentangled and make it possible for more people to find their own places and be able to announce, establish, and keep them. Finally, in the historiographical register, looking across movements, boundaries, and institutions highlights the role that both sympathy and empathy played in the transformation of the 1960s, and I would think probably play in social and legal transformation more generally. Both empathy and sympathy were necessary to the vagrancy law challenge, and I have two uh, uh, examples to use here. So the civil rights movement was the most legally sympathetic movement of the time. The existence of slavery, Jim Crow, the brutality and violence going on in the South, even as uh, the court is deciding these cases, raised the visibility of vagrancy laws because they touched on the civil rights movement. Uh, and when uh, uh, Anthony Amsterdam starts challenging vagrancy laws because they are some of the laws that are used to arrest civil rights protesters, um, both in public and in private, uh, the profile of the vagrancy law problem just explodes into public consciousness. Um, and it raised the visibility and it made 
the enforcement of vagrancy laws against civil rights protesters a huge problem uh, because people thought that racial discrimination at this time was a huge problem. That said, it was not until after a spate of vagrancy arrests of white hippies in 1968 that, as one lawyer put it, vagrancy laws began falling like nine pins. In other words, it was not until judges felt empathy rather than sympathy that they could envision their own sons and daughters swept up in the vagrancy net that they took major steps to undermine the laws. But it's not simply that empathy exists here and sympathy exists there and you need both. It's actually that the two uh, 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 overlapped and intertwined. So the hippies' most promising arguments that they made in their challenge to vagrancy laws at this time relied on their commonalities with African Americans, their minority status, their unpopularity, their unequal treatment. So they go back and they say, you think this is a problem because we're like you, but you also think it's a problem because we're just like the people who you think the law should be most solicitous of right now. So far from the insular histories that disaggregate the 60s of the civil rights movement from the 60s of the counterculture, the history of vagrancy relies on the simultaneous deployment of sympathy and empathy, of the understanding that what ailed the most sympathetic marginalized other was also what ailed the empathy-inducing insider. And you can see this throughout uh, the vagrancy challenge, including in Papa Christu itself and including in the fundamental legal doctrine that the court uses here, which is void for vagueness, which has within it concern both about discriminatory enforcement, sympathy, the other, only certain groups of people, marginalized people are going to fall at the hands of this law, and arbitrary enforcement. This can happen to anyone. It can happen to you. It can happen to me. It can happen to my child. That such a dynamic operated elsewhere in other aspects of the transformation of the 1960s and beyond seems very likely to me, though whether and how are questions for another day. Of course, Papa Christou is not the end of the story. Far from it. A key tenet of the new constitutional history is that Supreme Court decisions are never the end of the story of legal change. They are one punctuated and important moment in that process, but only one such moment. So the historical and normative questions also look different once we take on this new methodological approach. The historical question, what changed? What was the nature of this legal change? Um, Excuse me. It's been 40 years since Papa Christou was decided, uh, and we are still clearly dealing with its aftermath. You can think of the Philadelphia Starbucks incident last year. You can think of the new efforts to criminalize poverty as just two examples. Um, and in part, what came afterwards resulted from the way the Supreme Court invalidated the vagrancy laws themselves. This goes back to void for vagueness. The new constitutional history doesn't treat the court as a singular force, but neither is the court simply epiphenomenal, just politics, just a result. We mean many different things when we discuss a case. And uh, Serena Mayeri, a legal historian at Penn, uh, is the first person who said this to me, and I think it's really brilliant, and so I always have to cite her when I say it. Um, we, when we say a case, and you should think about this, this when, when you're thinking about um, cases. We mean a legal outcome, Papa Christi wins, Jacksonville loses. We think a political intervention, the court sides with vagrancy law challengers, the social movements of the 1960s against the police and the establishment. We mean legal doctrine, void for vagueness. We mean a cultural symbol, the court vindicating the rights of the marginalized. We mean the whole legal process that leads into uh, a case. And we mean an instruction to lower courts which in this case was make your laws clearer. So what a case says is important for more than just the precedential effect it will have on judges. It's important for the image of reality it reflects, the people it empowers, the people it disempowers, the people it angers, the categories it creates that reflect back into the world and uh, engender new action. So in Papa Christou, Justice Douglas considered saying that vagrancy laws violated some constitutionally protected rights to dissent or to nonconformity. He also also uh, thought about, and uh, other courts did, declare status crimes uh, like vagrancy unconstitutional. But what he said, and the Burger Court said in 1972 instead, was that vagrancy laws were too vague. Legislators needed to go back and write more specific laws that would tell both people and law enforcers what exactly was illegal. No longer could a single law serve so many purposes with no legislative involvement. This meant that the police sought authority elsewhere. 
in both existing powers and in new legislation. Policing migrated to existing laws that seemed better poised than vagrancy to comply with this new anti-vagueness constitutional command. Laws prohibiting prostitution, public drunkenness, disorderly conduct, breach of the peace. And as a society, we constructed new forms of both civil and criminal law to address new challenges and developments that were simultaneous or followed on this vagrancy law uh, invalidation. The deinstitutionalization of the mentally ill happened at the very moment that the Supreme Court undermined law enforcement methods for dealing with the mentally ill on the streets. The increase in drug traffic and especially of crack cocaine, together with the rise in gang violence, the retributive turn in criminal justice, which meant heightened penalties across the board. There were many non-legal mechanisms of keeping people in particular places or out of other particular places. And these also proliferated and continued, like suburbanization, exclusionary zoning, white flight, gated communities, urban renewal, federal housing subsidies, the placement of federal highways, anti-homeless technologies like benches with those armrests that prevent lying down. And finally, legislators identified more specific types of people and activities for regulation. They made laws targeting potential criminals um, by saying you prohibit not just loitering, but loitering with a criminal purpose. Drug possession laws, stop and frisk, traffic stops, laws targeting the homeless meant sleeping on park benches or panhandling. As a historical matter then, the constitutional end of the vagrancy law regime as it had been practiced in various guises for some 400 years was not the end of social control, it was not the end of police discretion, it was not the end of exclusion or subordination. Which brings me to the final normative question. What does this story tell us about the state of the law we see today and how to think about it in the future? Does the existence of these new regulations mean that my whole story is for naught, that we are right back where we started in 1950? If not vagrancy laws, then these others, and there's no real difference between them. I have struggled uh, with these questions throughout the project, and some part of me agrees with that, uh, that the mechanisms of power shift rather than truly change, and that new forms of power simply come to replace the old ones. But in the end, I resist that conclusion, in large part because of the wide lens that the new constitutional history provides. I think there are really important ways in which the world is different today normatively. On a constitutional level, Papa Christu reflected and embodied the idea that vagrancy was a constitutional issue. If vagrancy laws had constitutional dimensions, then the Constitution's reach was much further than previously thought. The vagrancy law invalidation reshaped the conversation about what power the police should have and what rights the individual. It shifted constitutional resources away from the police and gave them to the powerless, the outsiders, the marginalized. On a more concrete level, constitution erosion, constitutional erosion of vagrancy laws had three, in my view, salutary effects. First, the new regulations have more transparency, and that means that their substance changes. It is no longer possible for local officials or police officers to hide behind vagrancy laws what their intent is. So long as these broad and vague status crimes existed, they were able to turn their attention to any new challenge, any new danger, without legislation, without any transparency, without any accountability. The beats show up, you start using it against the beats. The civil rights protesters show up, you start using it against civil rights protesters. After the end of the vagrancy law challenge, one, a legislature would have to identify the threat and publicly stand up for containing that threat, leading to public discussion and accountability. That is very different from the vagrancy era. Second, and relatedly, it was in the very nature of vagrancy laws that they can't actually be replaced except by other vagrancy laws. Vagrancy laws were ubiquitous, they were protean. And the various laws that I listed above are only partial replacements. No matter how they try, and no matter how many of them there are, they cannot cover all of the landscape that vagrancy laws covered, precisely because they have to be specific and obvious where vagrancy laws were broad and hidden. Third, and the result of one and two, the invalidation of vagrancy laws was far more unsettling to state and local laws than I think is typically understood. 
They played such varied roles in both social control and crime control that it has taken enormous new political, financial, and law enforcement resources to even partially replace the work that vagrancy laws did. And that's why we continue to see efforts to replace what vagrancy laws did. These technologies, these techniques, and these laws exist in part because vagrancy laws no longer do. And if we want to understand the work these laws are doing and the work they aren't doing and what the future holds and how we, and especially you, might shape it, we have to cross all of the internal boundaries that render invisible so much of our history of constitutional contestation by embracing a new form of constitutional history that can reveal what those vagrancy laws did, where they went, and why. Thank you. Questions? We have questions?